What's going on, guys? Thanks for checking out another episode of Eastern Current. This is the uh, fishing podcast that we do here, and we are super excited about tonight. We've got, uh, or I've got, one of my best friends on tonight. Uh, one of my, f- honestly, someone that I, I've had him on some of the videos before, but uh, we really learned a lot of how we fish this area together. We spent so much time uh, in college on the water when we should have been in class, when we should have been doing so many other things. We spent <laughs> spent time on the water learning how to uh to catch redfish flounder and trout mostly at first and uh it was it it was awesome i mean i remember the first time we called uh we sight fished a redfish together polling we were so stoked and uh, caught lot caught lots of flounder together that's what tonight's episode's about um is flounder fishing i think one of the biggest flounder we ever caught together we'll have to share this story but it was with my mom <laughs> one time um which was a really cool she still talks about her citation flounder that she caught with us um but but yeah we've had so many fishing adventures all around the country together and um, just excited to bring this this episode to y'all because I think y'all really enjoy it. Before we jump into it, uh, be sure to go check out Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. Uh, it's where all the listeners can come together, uh, you know, share their catches and talk and ask questions. And uh, it's a really safe zone for you to ask any questions that you have and to hopefully maybe make some fishing friends and get out in the water together and go catch some uh, catch some fish. But um, let me know uh, on Instagram on Facebook. I'm thinking about bringing. Uh, another person on to Eastern Currents to do a freshwater podcast that would be about three times a month. It wouldn't. We'd still have the same amount of saltwater podcasts, uh, but but it would be bringing to you fly fishing and um, you know uh, just pretty much all things freshwater fishing, um, from fly fishing to bass fishing to uh, cat fishing, just everything in the freshwater world. Um, I'm trying to decide if. If it's something we want to do with Eastern Current, if we just want to stick strictly salt water, um, we are. I, mean, I am starting to do a lot of hunting videos on the YouTube channel as well. I'm not sure I'm going to do any hunting podcast stuff, but um, a, a, as far as the whole media platform, we're going to branch out some more. Um, we're excited about it, and and I hope y'all are as well. But let me know what y'all think about the whole freshwater side of things. We'll still we'll still be salt water based, salt water focused, but we'll just have another tool for y'all to learn how to go catch fish. Um, in both fresh and salt water with a more salt water uh, base. So um, without me just talking in circles too much longer, I'm going to go ahead and bring on my good buddy, Mike Bell. Real name, Michael. I call him Mike. We were discussing, do I put Michael or Mike on your on your lower third here? And he said, I think I was Michael last time. So that's what we went with. What's going on, man? Not much. How are you today? Oh, doing all right. Doing all right. Excited I didn't get, uh, or thankful that I didn't get, dumped on today there's some gnarly storms that came through oh yeah it was like was actually oh, thinking about that same story with your mom um when we were talking about this episode oh, oh yeah about <laughs> her big flounder that was uh that was nuts that was a really awesome day of fishing um lots of speckled trout and that massive flounder so i've never caught a flounder even close to that big in that area since then which is which is crazy oh. but i guess i haven't done a ton of flounder fishing me and ben fished that creek one time during a tournament and I mean, to this day, if you ask him, he had the biggest flounder ever <laughs> on. And I mean, it was acting like a flounder. I mean, he, and he pulled it off at the boat. And uh, yeah, th- I maybe don't bring it up with him. He's kind of still sad about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Michael. Uh, every time I look at Michael's Instagram, it's it's like releasing a flounder, releasing a flounder, releasing a flounder, release. I mean, you're just, you've been crushing them this year, man. And you fish a lot of the stuff up here i fish a lot of, if i'm if i'm like going flounder fishing inshore i like to fish the river and you really like to fish all the 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 stuff up from you know from carolina beach up to top little beach it seems like it's a little closer to the house yeah so it's just kind of where i end up at um so now it's kind of hard to make an hour drive down to the river to fish yeah so, yeah but i know i like the clean water yeah so I like the dirty water. It keeps me optimistic. <laughs> like I can, I don't know that there's a, not a fish right there, so I'm going to just keep casting. Yeah. Um, well, sweet. Well, you guys, today we're going to talk about, and if you're in North Carolina, this will apply across the board, but we're really excited here because we have our flounder season opening. Um, so that means we are allowed to harvest flounder recreationally. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to switch the screen here. Harvest flounder recreationally uh, for 30 days, starting on Sunday. Is it the yep. 16th? August, August 16th. It's actually through, I believe, September 30th this year. September 30th. Oh, so it's more than 30 days. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that, that's. I think we got mistake. about 45 this year. About 45 days. So, um, if you're like me, I've seen such an, a, a huge amount of flounder in the water lately, and I'm not saying all these flounder got big because we st- we you know we cut the season or we 
stopped allowing ourselves to take fish. But there is no arguing that there are a lot more fish around this year than than any year in the past. Um, last year was a was a decent flounder year on summers and gulfs, but I'm seeing more southerns come back and um, just excited to see you know the state take a stand for conservation and I really like to see, you know, the outcome. It's pretty cool when, when you, you do something for a resource and it and does something back. Um, so have you kind of, do you feel like you've seen a lot more fish around this year? I've seen a lot more fish this year. Um, definitely a lot more Southern flounder, like you were saying, and I've seen a bigger size range of fish. Like normally it seems like you catch fish every year. It's like consistent, like that 14, 14 and a half inch fish. And you might get one keeper a day this year. I, I mean, there's days I've gone out and I've my first five fish have been 18 to 20 inches. Yeah. You know, and I've never had a year that's been that good. Now I'm obviously I'm still catching small fish, and you know I'm I'm glad they're there. That's what we need to continue to grow. But I also want people to realize we've got to have, we're gonna have to endure the closure for several years so that our bio stock can come back. That way we got plenty of fish this year. Hopefully, you know they'll make it through the season, spawn this fall then next year you know those ones that spawned this year will be starting to grow develop and they'll be you know a bigger biomass in two to three years to start spawning again yeah and that's what it's all about so Definitely. you know i mean i hate to lose a few years of being able to catch flounder but at the same time if we if we do this and hang on to it which i hope the state does um you know and keep it closed for a good portion of the year hopefully in three four years we might really see a good comeback of them definitely and, and one thing i've learned with this closure is it's still really fun to go target flounder even though you can't keep them i feel like mentally a flounder is a fish that's like if i catch it i gotta kill it like it's so hard to get away from that mindset but man really like working down a bank like hardcore effectively like really trying to catch flounder uh it's one fish here in north carolina that you can you can really pick a lot of fish out i mean i've we had a day in the river, or I had a, a day in the river after a trip the other day. I was I, I was trying to fish this CCA tournament. Um, I only really got to fish this two hours that I out of the whole two weeks from by myself and, and try to try to fish. And I could I fished on some charters, but I couldn't be the one like you know bombing a topwater plug out in front of my clients' plugs. I had to kind of fish the scraps behind everybody else. Um, and so i went out for two hours i'm like all right i'm gonna try to get a couple flounder get me on the board and i caught 11 flounder and like i think it was really like an hour and a half and i had like a 22 and a half a 21 and a half a couple 18s i mean there, there's just a lot of good flounder um out there and it's we're gonna talk to you all today about like how to target these with both inshore and nearshore and with bait and artificials because me and me and michael kind of target these in different ways in different areas so i think we'll be able to bring to y'all a, uh, a good mixture of, of knowledge to hopefully get y'all out there and catch you some fish. And hopefully if you're here in North Carolina, be able to bring a couple home and, and eat them for dinner. One thing I do want to stress though, please, please, please is like, I know you haven't been able to kill flounder in a while, but that just doesn't mean we need to go out there and stockpile flounder for the freezer. Like if you catch two or three fish and that's going to feed you for the week, like let the other fish go, go come catch them another day. They're super fun to catch. Those big ones pull hard. Um, and another thing that I'm a firm believer of is is a slot size for flounder eventually. I think that allowing the big breeders to go back, just like we want to do with redfish, just like we want to do with trout, is very, very important. Um, and I'm going to personally release every flounder I catch that's over 22 inches this year. Like, I think I probably should do 20, but 15 to 22 is kind of my, my slot size. And now with clients, if they want to keep a fish, I'm going to urge them, hey, let's let this fish go, see if we can get some 18s or 17s. Um, but but my goal is to personally release every fish over 22 inches that I catch. Uh, just like any fish, the bigger they are, the more eggs, the more repopulating it does, the more fish are, are going to bite your lure. So like if you don't want to let the big breeders go, don't complain about crappy days of fishing <laughs> is really what it boils down to. And the egg count on those just from like a 20 to a 22 inch fish is exponentially huge. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge jump. So, you know. We Even talking hundreds more, thousands more, thousands to more than that, wow. depending on the size of fish. You That's know, awesome. I mean, there it really makes a huge difference when you're talking only maybe ten to thirty percent of the fish that ten to thirty percent of the eggs that are fertilized during the spawn every year actually make it. Wow, you know, yeah, it, there's a huge number of eggs that just are gone. So 
every percent or every fish that we release that you know can spawn and have more babies the better off we are yeah so. for sure for sure more fish in the water um, means more fish in the water and that's what everybody wants everybody wants more fish in the water we can't argue that nobody's like no nah, i think i want less flounder out there and re- less red fish out there um so let's help help repopulate well all right let's jump into um flounder fishing and and kind of tactics and whatnot um, I, let's go with inshore first and let's talk about before we get into bait let's talk about artificials um, okay. and kind of talk about how we how we choose what we're going to throw um, and, and what we throw and how we retrieve it. So I'm gonna let you go first and kind of talk about, let's just say your, your, your number one inshore rig for flounder as far as artificials go. Um, I mean, I'll probably stick to just a very basic quarter to three eighths ounce jig head. Mm-hmm. And that does sound very heavy, but when it comes flounder season, I love to get it just right down on the bottom and be able to work it. Um, and I'm also using just normal paddle tails. And I try to, as the year goes on, I change my size of paddle tail. Look at the mullet that's in the water, look at the bait that's around you. And, you know, color sometimes I don't feel like makes as big of a difference as size does. Yeah. You know, if you're, you're fishing in an area and every mullet's two or three inches long, don't put on a five inch diesel minnow or four inch diesel minnow the amount of bites that you're going to get is probably going to go down. Yeah. So, you know, match the hatch in a lot of sense, you know, a lot of cases for that. Um, and also if you have to throw a bigger diesel minnow or something like that, especially in the Z man, the plastics float. So you definitely have to step up your uh, jig head size yeah, to make definitely. sure you're getting down on the bottom. Yeah. They'll, so. they'll want to float it up pretty bad. And I think that's a huge point that you made there as far as, you know, look at the bait around you. And, and a good rule of thumb is like the later in the summer that you get, the larger those mullet are when we first get those white mullet. I mean, the striped mullet are, are large year round, but when we first get those white mullet each year, they're little, you know, right when they first come in. And now we're starting, I'm starting to catch, you know, some four inchers, some five inchers, and, and maybe even a little bit bigger than that. And, and those flounder will eat big baits, but I think... Oops like you're saying keying in on the size of the bait that's around them is so important and i think too a lot of people get discouraged as you go on into the summer because you're not catching as many fish but the bait gets so big that when a flounder eats a five six inch mullet it doesn't have to eat again right away right you know so you might you might see a little downturn later on in the year especially on artificials with just the bait getting bigger but I know in the beginning of the year, which me and you were talking one day, we were both on the water, and I was like, man, I've watched five flounder follow my bait right up to the side of the boat. Like, they're just aggressive in the beginning of the year once that small bait starts coming in because they've got to eat, you know, multiples of them to get good and full. So definitely see that aggressive pattern. If they're chasing it like that, you know you've got the right bait. Definitely, definitely. Um, and, and color, the flounder are very opportunistic. They're going to eat a lot of colors is what I feel like. But personally, they're like they're opportunistic. I'm gonna throw something that they're gonna see. So I oftentimes will throw a variation of white. Um, not always. I mean, I, I catch a lot of flounder in different colors. But if I'm like just flounder fishing, I'm usually fishing a white diesel minnow, either a four inch or a five inch, or like a white longer fluke Z man. Um, just be and, and a lot of times with clients too, because I'm like, all right, they might be making some casts that aren't exactly where they need to be, but with this bait that fish is going to see it, you know, even if it's five yeah. feet away and flounder will move for a bait. Like you don't have to come right over their face with it. Um, oh, yeah. uh, is there a color that you tend to draw towards more than another or, or do you kind of stick with, or do you kind um, of fish whatever? I mean, I kind of stick to like my normal trout colors just because yeah. every time it comes to trout season, I stock up on Z-mans and I get kind of a wide variety. So yeah. You know, I try to stick with a dark back, light belly. Um, and this too is the difference though in where me and you fish a lot. Cause I love fishing that cleaner water, especially like this year, we've had crazy clean water all the way yeah. through the middle of July. Such a lack of rain, which I've loved. <laughs> yeah, it's been awesome. Which you've had clear water down in the river, but it's still tea stained. Right. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't get into the chartreuse and the pinks and oranges and all the different crazy colors. Not to say that you can't catch flounder on it, but a lot of times I'm still trying to target redfish and trout and stuff with those same baits. Right, so I try to right. stick to a natural colored um, artificial as much as possible. And I'll 
go with a different shade. One, you know, I might start in the mornings with a dark back and then move to more of an olive or a brown back throughout the day. Yeah. Um, to see if that makes a difference. Most of the time it doesn't. Sometimes it does, but it, it might help me pick up an extra trout or two throughout the day too. Yeah. Is definitely. really the big reason for the change. Definitely. So well, let, let's transition this conversation, I guess, into like, all right, all right, now we, we like like I was saying, flounder opportunistic feeders. They're gonna eat a, a bait fish looking something. So and we've shared with y'all what we like, but but now it's like where are these flounder? And, and that's something that's kind of fun to dive into because the cool thing about flounder is they're in a lot of places. Like if it looks fishy, they're probably flounder there. Um, and and but but some of the things that I like to key in on, I, I'm gonna talk about where and like how to fish it. Um, I like banks that are you know a long stretch of bank or a long side of a creek that's got not just you know a deep cut bank not just a deep cut drop off but i kind of want that tapered bank i want some oyster bars in there i want some little points and some little creek mouths draining in like if i get a long bank with spread out oyster bars on it and little small creeks draining into it that there's going to be flounder all over that bank um things that are going to hold bait up things that are going to pinch point bait like a little point where all the baits got to come around the point or a creek mouth with an eddy where all the bait's going to come around the, you know, the, or out of the creek, uh, into the eddy. Those are spots that flounder sit. Just look for something that looks different on the bank, uh, and fi- fish that, uh, as far as current, as far as, you know, actual structure. Um, and, and one thing that I want to share too, is like flounder are not afraid to sit really, really, really shallow. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, big flounder, deep water. Um, but, but I will tell you right now that me and Michael both pull skiffs. Um, so we're up high, we've got a really good vantage point and you get out in the morning at low, low, dead, low tide and start pulling around, uh, looking for redfish, you will spook massive flounder out of like two inches of water. They'll be sitting right up on the bank when they're in two inches of water, every bait fish that swims over is an inch away from their face. So they want to sit in, in where they, they want to sit in areas where the bait is going to be drawn close to the bottom, or they're going to be close to the surface by sitting on the bottom. So Early in the morning, low light, those fish will a lot of times lay up shallower, but even in the middle of the day. So don't be afraid to throw that jig all the way up in the mud and slide it off into the into the water. I mean, I've caught so many fish this year, flounder, in less than eight inches of water. Um, but yeah. Do you see that same kind of scenario playing true for you, Mike? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was actually just thinking one of one of the creeks that me and you fish a good bet for redfish. Um, the oyster bar that's right there in the middle. I can't tell you how many times I have pulled down that creek and we're talking this thing's barely wide enough the channel is barely wide enough to get my skip through if if you miss it you're dragging oysters on the side of your boat and i've spooked more flounder off of that one point visually than i have this year than i have ever before yeah um you know and like you said two three inches of water they're sitting there and points intersections anywhere that there's a change um a transition of some sort that's that's a lot of times what I'm keying in on. And if you see a long bank that has kind of the same same kind of grass line and then the grass line breaks up just a little bit, something where bait can go in and out. It doesn't have to be big. You know, it could just be a difference in the thickness of the grass. It could be enough to make the difference for a flounder to sit there. Definitely. Um, but like you said too, I'm looking for I, at higher tides, I'm, I'm looking for that tapered bank, something where they can go right up to the edge of the grass and be in shallow water. But once the tide actually drops out, I'm looking for deep holes, especially once it starts to get real low in the grass to where that bait has to almost be in the creek. I start to transition to looking for those very steep drop off banks. Um, just because it's a hard edge that those mullet have to travel down now. Yeah. And there's nowhere for them to go but out into the middle. So now it's kind of game over for them if a flounder's sitting there. Yeah. And it can be a little deeper for them, and they can still come up and get that bait because it's such a you know a sheer wall. The mullet can't go anywhere. Yeah, so, for, sure. for um, sure. You know, just as the tide's shifting, there's little nuances and stuff where the fish will move to make it easier on themselves. Definitely. Um, another place that I like to look is the backside of sandbars just wide open creeks and I will pull up on one side of the sandbar or one side of the creek and I'll throw it up to the top of the sandbar and let it float down and I've seen a lot of fish this year and caught a lot of fish doing that yeah and it doesn't have to really be that there's 
you know, a big transition or anything, but something about them being able to just get out in the middle and be able to hide. Um, Definitely. I, I don't know what it is. I honestly haven't figured it out this year, but I've caught a lot of fish doing that this year. It's crazy, so. too. A lot of times you'll catch those fish in the sand, and they're that more tan color, that, you know, yep. the different variation of the flounder. But um, another thing, too, that, that I always want to share with people and share with my clients is, like, one, you're flirting with, you know, snagging up, but flounder <laughs> will sit right on top of oysters. Like, big oyster mm-hmm. beds, they'll lay on top of the oysters. They don't need mud or sand bottom. I mean, they're they're they're... Uh, pattern and everything actually blends in really, really well on top of oysters. Um, and I, when I started kind of keying in on that, pulling around, I'm like, God, that flounder just spooked off right off the oysters. Like there's <laughs> nothing but an oyster bed right there. And they're just literally just laying on top of those oysters waiting for bait fish. And that's where bait hangs out. You know, it makes sense that they would oh, slide yeah. up and sit on top of that rock because that's where the bait's hanging out. Well, that and all the little shrimp, little baby shrimp, especially early in the summer, you know, they'll move up into the grass, but once the water comes out of the grass, they've got to find something to hide down in. Yeah. And oysters are a great spot for them to do. And as, as soon as they come out, boom, yeah. fun, they're nailing them. And I think anyone that's been out early in the morning, low, low tide, and you hear all these blow-ups, and you're like, you don't see fish swimming off. You know, you'd think you'd see a flounder taking off or a redfish taking off. Those are flounder. I mean, they're up there. They'll be way up on a flat, super shallow um, in the morning when the light's low. And I think they sit more near those deeper edges when the sun gets up because they are definitely uh, very uh, targeted by ospreys. And so when the sun's up and the ospreys can see the flounder, they're not going to be sitting way up on a flat. You'll find them more shallow but with a deep drop-off nearby. But in the mornings, like if you've got some areas with big wide-open flats where the mullet's cruising all out over top of the flat – Go throw a white jig or white jerk shad or white paddle tail and just drag it across the bottom out there in the morning early, and you will catch flounder. I promise you that. If you don't, hit me up, and I will <laughs> do something. <laughs> but it's a it's good a, way to get one on a top water too. Yeah, it is. They'll crush a top water. You just have to fish yeah. it in shallow enough water. So yep. that's crazy. Yeah. I've seen Michael's caught him on top water fly with me. Remember that on a on a gurgler, <laughs> and that wasn't even that shallow. That's the crazy no. thing. Uh, that was really cool. And then we've both caught them on top water plugs. I had a guy catch one on a wake bait the other day. That was neat. It's like second cast of the morning. Just, I mean, it sounded like a redfish. He freaking tanked it. And I was like, oh, man, second cast. That's not a good sign. We're not going to catch anything today. And he gets into the boat. And um, it was a really nice flounder, probably a 20-inch flounder. Just smoked a little speckled trout colored wake bait. Heck, yeah. I love – I mean, if I'm going to be out throwing a fly rod – especially during trout season with a sink tip and a clouser i mean that's the way to do it and yeah you'll you know you're always picking up or always have the chance to pick up a flounder it seems like definitely so i know that's how i normally catch them yeah and i'll even take that with me during the you know during the summer um and i'll just leave a floating line on and i'll wait till low tide and i go and find deeper holes where i know they kind of have that sharp bank to you know sit up against yep and i'll throw it right there and pick them up on clousers so Heck yeah is there a clouser color that you've seen works better for flounder? The old honestly, chartreuse and white or something? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I said I'd stay away from uh, chartreuse and oranges and stuff, but I think one of my best uh, clouser flies for flounder has been orange and white. Orange and white? Right on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a little bit. It's like a flouser so little, so having some type of something that shows it up or helps it show up is definitely important, I feel like. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's talk about. Uh, we'll just stick with the inshore thing, but let's talk a little bit about bait fishing for these fish. Like, uh, right. I think it can be a super effective way to target fish. And if you've got people in your boat with you that that you know aren't aren't very savvy with a you know with casting a jig and working it back to the boat, and, and bait fishing is just fun too. And there's a lot of guys that like to bait fish for flounder. So, um, I, I was bait I would bait fish for flounder today. So and I, I really enjoy it. I just I think learning and being a well-rounded angler in, in all different avenues you know live live bait cut bait artificials fly rod it, it's going to help you be an ang- better angler uh long term uh, across the board so um one thing that i really want to share as far as bait fishing goes uh is is a, is a is a way that I'll, i like to fish bait for flounder and, and i catch redfish this way too and trout um, but that's fishing flounder on a float um, with live mullet or live mud minnows. And my favorite is with you know a nice four inch um, live mullet uh, or a small you know peanut pogie like a four inch pogie. But what I'm doing is I'm getting one of those clamp on floats where it's got the little metal bracket up top, little metal bracket on the bottom. You can pinch it, slide the line in there, 
um, and I'll, I'll change the uh, the depth obviously with what I'm uh, with with what depth I'm fishing. But what I'll do is I'll I'll set that leader. I'll put two to three split shots depending upon the size of the mullet and kind of the, the spunkiness of the mullet. But usually two split shots will do it. And I'll put those I'll clamp those on about five inches above a circle hook. And I'll put that mullet on there, and I want it set where that mullet is going to be have about four inches of, of room to move around on the bottom when I cast it, so that he's going to kind of drag, but there's not going to be a lot of scope. If there's a lot of scope, it's going to slow the the bobber down almost to where it's going to stop. Um, so what you want to do is you want to have it pretty steep, so that current will push that um, that float and that bait along a bank. And so what I'll do is is get my clients on the bow, um, if I've got clients or myself if I'm running the trolling motor, um, and kind of get into a creek set the boat in the right spot with the trolling motor uh, and just kind of drift with those floats while casting them up against the bank. That way, you know, with a Carolina rig and flounder, um, mul- fl- or redfish swim back and forth and, and kind of work through an area, but flounder a lot of times are laying in one area um, waiting to ambush a bait. And so by fishing these floats this way, I'm able to cover water. I don't have to reel in and recast and reel in and recast like an artificial. I can literally just keep that bait right at the exact distance off the bank I want or exact distance off the oyster bar and just drift through with the current, fish an entire creek. Um, you can fish two or three rods off the bow of the boat and since you're not casting you know, multiple times over and over again, um, it works really well for a lot of people. And I catch, I probably catch more flounder inshore on bait doing that than anything else. Um, and there's you know, the classic Carolina rig, which, which is a great lure for, uh, for bait fishing, but that, that float rig is, is super important. And again, that's a float a clamp style float. You can get them intercoastal angler. You can get them any saltwater tackle shop. Um, I'll run. I'll, I'll do two full arm lengths of fluorocarbon. I do twenty pound fluorocarbon, so two full stretches, uh, fingertip to fingertip off the spool. That way, I can uh, set it wherever. I, if I'm fishing some larger, deeper channels, you know, I can set it six, seven, eight feet. That's um, harder to cast that way. But since you're not casting over and over again, you know, you just kind of lob a cast out there and let it sit, um, and then. It's just a, it's a really effective way to do it. So, but, but, oh, sorry. So the float, the leader, the split shots and the circle hook and the mullet, of course. Uh, but Michael, let's talk a little bit about, since I've kind of talked in circles there about the, the float rig. I was like, before we got on here, I was like, Michael, the one thing I want to share is the float rig. So I was just uh, <laughs> glad I've got that off my chest. Um, tell me a little bit about kind of your go-to setup for, uh, for bait fishing for flounder. So I kind of have the opposite approach of you. I... I throw what I call a reverse Carolina rig. So I'll actually take about three foot a liter and tie kind of like a offshore chicken rig Mm -hmm. um, where I'll leave about 18 inches to two foot of liter between my weight and my hook. And I'll have my hook um, that 18 to 24 inches above the weight. So the weight is the very last thing um, at the bottom. And I'm throwing normally a one ounce weight three quarters to one ounce. That's okay. kind of the smallest bank sinker that you can get to loop on. Um, but the reason for that is, is when I'm reeling my bait back or really my, you know, my rig back, my bait is always passing my flounder first before the weight is. So yeah. instead of me with a Carolina rig, you know, working it back and my weight bumping right into the head of a flounder and spooking it off or whatever, or having this big mud cloud in front of it, depending on what kind of bottom you're fishing on. And then your bait's lost in that. Um, your bait comes over just natural, you know, and especially most of the time I'm only fishing like 15 pound, 20 pound, like you said, Yeah. um, fluorocarbon here and there just kind of depends on how clear the water is. But, um, you know, that bait's natural looking still. It's in front of the weight. It's up off the bottom. And, you know, you can fish a dead bait effectively with this too. So if you go out and you catch bait in the morning and by the end of the day, you've only, you know, they're dead or whatever, you couldn't keep them alive, um, you know, it, it's not as big of a deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they don't have to look super lively. So, and with that, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm fishing it very slow. I cast it up to the bank and I let it drop right against the grass line. I just let it sit there 10, 15 seconds. I reel two to three feet, let it sit there 10, 15 seconds, reel it in two, three, four feet. And once I clear kind of what my target area is, and you'll pick this up as you go through the day, as you're fishing, you're going to notice, all right, I've been catching most of my fish within 10 feet of the bank or within five feet of the bank. You know, once I kind of cover that targeted area, a lot of times I'm picking it up and I'm pitching it right back in and I'll move four or five feet down 
three, four feet down, you know, whatever down the bank. And I'm really just pinpointing and picking apart those high, high percentage areas where those flounder can be sitting. So, um, instead of covering like a big area with one cast, um, it's kind of a pinpoint deal. But well, and another thing that a lot of people, I, I think they catch little croaker and they pitch them back over the side. Flounder love little croaker. Yeah. Croaker, menhaden, mullet, um, the little killifish, all that kind of stuff. They, they will eat it. So definitely, um, I know you like mud minnows and, uh, mullet but i like mud minnows because they can be so easy to catch sometimes but i don't think they're necessarily the best bait all the time in the winter they work great there's barely any bait fish in the water and so you put a big old fat slow mud minnow out there and they're like oh i'll slurp that thing down but um, yeah. I, I think i think i really like a mullet because of its hardiness on a hook as well as its its ability to or not its ability but it's just spunky man it moves around a bunch it swims around the hook like a mud minnow on a carolina rig i think on a float where it's moving it's not a big deal but on like a carolina rig a lot of times a mud minnow is going to do what it's supposed to do and lay in the mud yeah. uh, and you don't get much action around around you know where you're fishing but you put a mullet on there he's going to be pulling around and trying to jump and swimming circles around your weight i think that's kind of and the min, min Hayden does the exact same thing but they just don't last quite as long um, so that's why why I don't like the uh, the Minhaden quite as much as the mullet for flounder. And with the Minhaden, don't be afraid to throw a six inch Minhaden. Yeah, may have to really feed it to that flounder, but that flounder, if you get one to eat it, it's gonna eat it. Yeah, so definitely. You may, and that's another thing. I feel like a lot of people aren't patient with flounder, and you know, if you're new to fishing with or fishing for flounder, that that's a big thing. If you feel a flounder bite. And you'll pick them up, like you'll you'll figure out what it feels like. It's it, I don't know what it is. It's, but it's just a such a quick smack, with yeah. no like takeoff, like a redfish. It's like a definite bite, a hard thump, but yeah. it just is kind of sitting still. And you just have to almost like a lot of times I just sit there and I feel it, and I'll open the bell on my rod, let out two feet of line, and close the bell and sit there for a second. Yeah, and then I'll swing, you know, or set the hook, but they especially with those bigger baits it takes them a minute to get it in their mouth just the way their mouth is positioned sideways when they come up off the bottom they've got to get the bait turned to to fit in their mouth right right versus like a redfish or a trout where they have more of a, a circular mouth anyways it's easier for them to get that bait in there where the you know the flounder is a little bit more of a side or flatter mouth definitely so Definitely. And, and be careful right now. Like if you're fishing small baits and you feel like you definitely got a flounder bite don't yeah. and it's not season, don't give it to them too long because right, sometimes yeah. they will suck it all the way down into their throat and then you're pretty much killing the fish. But, um, but that two second pause. Three yeah. Second two, three, pause, I don't yeah. think you have to sit there and smoke a cigarette and drink a beer like people say. Yeah. But I am exactly. definitely a believer of, of giving them a second. Um, unlike a redfish, I feel a bite. I'm setting the hook immediately. Like I'm giving that flounder two to five seconds. Um, yeah. you know, one, two, set the hook. One, two, three, four, five. I can't wait that long. That's even hard to just say it right <laughs> here sitting at the table. And I know I miss some fish because of that, but I'm like, you know, I give them two seconds and then I, I hit them. And if, if they didn't have it in their mouth, I'm not going to catch them. But maybe that's stupid. But I, I definitely think that it is, I mean, they will definitely continue to eat it. And with an artificial, do you feel like it plays, I mean, how long do you like to give them an a flounder when he eats an artificial like a jig i mean most of the time i just kind of set the hook on him i do too if i just I, get that it, smack i'm setting the hook yeah sorry for everyone I, listening in their cars so i just clapped my hands i know that's gonna be loud <laughs> <laughs> um but i think the difference is when you're fishing you know either either one of our bait rigs that bait's moving slow they have time to sit there and process look at it make a decision when you're working a jig most of the time i'm working a jig pretty quick i mean it's not like twitch 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 i'm like twitch 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 maybe a half second pause twitch 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 i'm moving that bait really qu pretty quickly yeah you know i'm i'm really focused on covering water i'm looking for that aggressive fish that's going to come up and nail it would you so, say as quickly as you can work it back to the boat usually uh with still being able to keep it on the bottom yeah that's kind of your your rate yeah yeah and, you know, if sometimes I want to move it quicker, I'll even go to just a bigger jig. You know, I've, I've fished a half ounce jig head sometimes, yeah. you know, just depending on depending on what the circumstances are. Heavy but, current and still wanting to work it fast kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. 
So definitely. Fun. Uh, well, sweet. Well, we've talked a little bit about the inshore bait fishing, and we're kind of just doing a broad, broad spectrum this tonight of like flounder fishing. Like, hey, season's coming up. Here's flounder fishing for you. So we're going to jump into some near shore stuff and kind of wrap up with that. Uh, I'm going to bring on some other guests to talk flounder fishing, and I'm going to continue to have Mike on uh, on a regular basis to talk about, um, you know, some of the fishing that we do together. I think we'll be uh, able to bring some good content to y'all and some good information. Um, sorry, I've got got a uh, little burp going on there, um, but but so let's talk about some of the near shore flounder fishing. Um, actually, before we do that, Mike, let's talk a little bit more about what to use like a high percentage area i remember you were saying high percentage area inshore fishing for flounder with bait like what are you looking for as far as what you want to where you want to fish i'm looking for points um and i'm fishing the the lower side of that the down current side of the points and i'm pitching it up most of the time i'm taking one cast on one side of the point and letting it come past and then i'll try the other side of the point and let it come past if they don't eat then i'm moving to the next spot yeah um, and does a point have to be a big massive point or can it just be like a tiny little point on a bank? No, it could be as simple as a five foot little cut in the grass or yeah. something like that. You know, it doesn't have to be, be huge by any yeah. means. No. Okay. Um, and there doesn't have to be a whole lot of transition bottom difference or anything on it either. You know, it's just, that is a spot where now there's multiple, you know, that bait's coming down either side of that grass line. Um, and the bait's got to figure out what to do. Do they go out in the middle or do they take a right or take a left, you know? So they're going to slow down and a flounder can ambush. Um, and the next thing is intersections with deep holes. Um, you know, and that's where I was talking about with the sandbar. A lot of times, like, those sandbars are where two creeks kind of come together. Mm-hmm. And that water's flowing over the sandbar from both creeks or where it's just split. And I'm fishing those. Okay. Um, and like I said earlier, little grass transitions the difference in the grass, whether it's, you know, really thick to really sparse grass or something that I'm pushing right on the edge of it. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Like any transition, any change, any difference is, is definitely something to key on. I was just thinking here, I think it might be smart for us to hold off on the near shore stuff, maybe do a whole separate podcast talking near shore because right. we've, we've got, we've, we've really got a good <laughs> chunk of stuff here and there's still some inshore stuff. Like I keep thinking about it. I'm like, all right, there's still some stuff I want to talk about. So let's transition into talking about like fishing man-made structure for flounder and, and kind of because that's a whole nother like, all right, we've talked about the creeks and the marsh and whatnot, but man-made structure is like a whole nother piece of the puzzle that is, mm-hmm. you know, there's really not much man-made structure offshore unless it's like an AR or artificial reef or a wreck. Um, but let's talk about how these fish orient to man-made structure, how to fish man-made structure, jig, you know, other artificials. Um, bait but what do you look for um if you're not going to go in the creeks uh, what do you look for as far as a a good area to target flounder um that's tough it depends on the time of year i feel like yeah um a lot of the creeks that have good docks and stuff at the front of them at the beginning of the year is where i'm going to start at and i'm looking for deeper water um i Honestly, I just hate losing rigs, so I don't fish super crazy docks that's got a ton of pilings or cables and that kind of stuff. A lot of times I'm targeting mainly floating docks with, you know, two or three pilings sticking up, and I'm pitching a lighter weight and that same reverse Carolina rig, and I'm throwing it up above the dock where the tide's coming in, and I'm getting a full swing underneath the dock just barely picking it up and letting the current push it yep. underneath that dock and once i get to the other side reel it up and i'll do it you know again i'll go as deep as i can back in there and do it again um i mean that's kind of my main thing and then from there i'll fish a few shallower docks and a few deeper docks and i figure out where i get a hit and then i kind of target from there yeah. So I'm looking for, you know, where are they at today? What are they keyed in on more than anything in that sense? Yeah. But, I think that's huge. That's you and I differ in that. You're like, I look for the docks that I'm not probably not going to get hung up in. And I'm like, <laughs> where's the nastiest, gnarliest dock? I'm going to pitch into it. Like, I like the old, gnarly, lots of growth. I lose a bunch yeah. of rigs and the fish sit on yeah. both of them. But for some reason, that's where my confidence is. I'm like, all right, there's a lot of growth. There's going to be a lot of bait fish. There's going to be flounder. Um, but there, there's a couple cool ways to fish docks 
Um, you know, there's the classic, just pitch a Carolina rig up underneath it, let it sit, maybe slowly reel it out. Um, mm. But one way that I, you and I fish together a lot too um, is with a jig head and a, and a mullet. A jig head and a soft plastic as well, but um, kind of you can work through a dock really quickly uh, if you if you get, you know, I like the four-inch mullet, you know, four-inch white mullet for, um, you know, blind casting with a jig underneath a dock. But I'll, I'll throw it up in there and I'll bounce it back out just like a, you know, a normal – um, like a normal jig head with a soft plastic on it. And you can do the same thing with, I feel like, because I haven't fished the reverse Carolina rig. It's definitely something I want to try. But you can kind of accomplish that same scenario. I guess with a jig head, you can kind of skip a mullet a little bit or yeah. or whatnot. But but also, just like you were saying, you can fish a dead mullet on a jig head and bounce it because you're giving it that action. Yeah, this, it's not as realistic as a live right. mullet, but it's still giving it enough to, if a flounder is going to eat uh, you know, a soft plastic, it's going to eat probably a dead uh, mullet that's being moved around by uh, a fishing rod. <laughs> well, and two, I'm not holding it tight to the weight like you are with a Carolina rig. You know, a lot of times I'm letting it have a little bit of slack, so that thing's just sitting there and kind of flooding, you know, fluttering in the current too. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you can you can kind of adjust and give your rod tip to a fish if it kind of eats it, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, but yeah, dock fishing is. I mean. The, the, that's what I love about flounder is there's so many different places to go target them uh, and you can do so well I mean like I said at the beginning of this podcast if it looks fishy there's a really good chance there's a flounder there uh, yeah. that's that I wish I could say that about a redfish here but but it, that's not the case um, you know there's a lot of water here that looks really good for redfish that has no redfish in it uh, with flounder if it looks really fishy like there's a really good chance that there's a flounder there or he was just there and he just missed him <laughs> so um, another thing that I, I guess I got, I kind of call it mega structures. Like a dock is just like a simple structure, but, but any large industrial dock, any, you know, mm-hmm. big bridge, uh, a large jetty, there's some other great areas to, to target flounder and, and some similar scenarios go down as far as how to do the, do so. But, uh, are there any, when I say that, are there any places that, that are not share your places, but like, uh, any scenarios like that, that, that kind of ring a bell in your head that, that you could talk about? Um, I'm trying to think, you know, probably the big one is the jetty that we have right here. Yeah. Um, you know, that transition line from, from rocks to sand. And even within that, there's a little bit of mud here and there and we keep coming back to transitions, but that, that change, you're looking, yeah, that little bit of change, but that line between the sand bottom and where it comes up to the rocks, the flounder can lay in the sand, they can hide themselves. And they're waiting for that bait to dart in and out of the rocks and that kind of stuff. Um, I know we fish a lot of docks in the river, um, you know, big industrial docks. And I'm picking it apart, piling by piling a lot yeah. of times. Um, and there's a lot of old docks and old structure in those same areas. And that just takes years of running into it with your trolling motor or hitting it with your prop to find it but you'll find that and it'll be kind of in the most unlikely spot but that's where i've caught a lot of flounder too yeah so yeah that i think that's huge um the transition area like you're saying is the ticket like and and where is or or here, here this is what i was thinking about so you're talking about fishing the jetty in that transition area one thing that i did i think i did this the beginning of last summer and it helped me so much for redfish and for and for flounder as well as for trout but talking about the jetty, on a calm day, I got my boat right beside the jetty, right beside it, and not where I was still picking up on my on my sonar, like you know the main part of the jetty, but I was looking for large boulders that were out off of the jetty, um, mm-hmm. and so I idled down it and I marked all of them with a certain logo on my GPS on on both my boats, because um, I'll, I'll some days I'll be out there on my skiff, like I'll run out from inshore fishing and I'll run out and fish the jetty on my skiff. Other days I'm, I'm you know, I'm just fishing the jetty and I've got my other boat. Um, but fishing around those larger rocks or just smaller rocks, but rocks that are pulled off the jetty a little bit, there is mm-hmm. always flounder on those. Always, yep. always flounders. Any piece of structure along a large piece of structure that sticks out a little bit further or protrudes a little bit further, those flounder yep. love that stuff. The redfish like it too, the trout like it, but flounder for sure love those like you know extensions of like a large piece of structure so um yeah i urge you i don't know why i'm sharing this because it's kind of like a little back pocket spot but no one shared (laughs) that with me it's just something that i thought 
Um, and so I feel safe sh- sharing it. But but idle down the jetty um, and, and mark those extensions of rocks that come out a little bit further and, and go fish those. Now, when you're casting at a rock underwater, expect to lose some rigs. But um, oh, yeah. <laughs> as always with flounder, like out there even, I'm fish- I want to fish as light as I can and still be able to be on the bottom. If that current's ripping in there, sometimes you got to fish, you know, an ounce and a half, two ounces. But today I was fishing uh, a half ounce in there, and I was holding the bottom with like a nice mullet really, really well. Um, and I've fished, you know, three sixteenth jigs in there and, and been able to bounce the bottom. So just really, you know, focusing in on like, all right, how light can I really get and be able to get this on the bottom? Because your bait's going to be able to move around a little bit more naturally. You're going to get some more bites like that. But um, sorry, that was another little tangent. Oh, no, you're good. That's kind of what I was talking about with, like, the industrial docks that we have down in the river. There's several that have been blown over by hurricanes. They're just old, and they've taken down the tops of them. I didn't know that, you know, they were there, but there's still submerged pilings and piles of junk. And as I was fishing down the, the normal pilings on the on the new docks, I was picking them up on the sonar, running into them with a the trolling motor. And I'm like, I'm going to try to fish 10 feet this way, and bam, I'm, you know, I'm still catching flounder or catching more flounder. Yeah. Then where most people are normally fishing right up underneath the docks and there's a couple old rock points and some of that stuff that stick out in the river that are really good. Yeah, so, definitely. Um I think too, especially river and with dock fishing, um flounder will hold on the same piece of structure for the ingoing or the incoming and the outgoing tide. Definitely. It's just a difference in which way the currents flow in, you know, and getting it to them where they're sitting at on that tide you know at the on an incoming when it's coming in from low it may be sitting out on the very far edge and then once it gets higher tide they may slide back underneath that dock or if it's higher you know higher sun during the middle of the day around noon they're gonna find that shady spot that they can sit in and they're even more hidden now yeah you know definitely so just you know picking up that little target area almost like your bass fishing um can make a huge difference for you too for sure, for sure. Uh, well, guys, I think that is kind of a wrap for this first flounder season series, I guess we can call it, where we're going to be talking a lot of flounder. Uh, I'm excited for flounder season. I know Michael's excited. I know all of y'all, all of y'all are. We've been having a lot of flounder questions come in. Um, but I think the one last thing I want to leave y'all with is um, they are creatures of habit just like any other fish. Like if you hook a big flounder in an area, remember that spot. Remember that tide. Remember every piece of that puzzle Um, and if you see a big flounder spook off of an oyster bar or a point when you're back in that area hit that point Um, that exact exact same spot that fish was laying if he's not there there's a really good chance there's another big flounder there so um, just keep that in mind now do you have any little uh, last tips that you want to share mike no i think we've pretty much covered everything we crushed it we were good at this (laughs) I, i mean i know there's definitely way more information out there that definitely could be given but i think as far as what i've put together in the past little bit especially this year um fishing hard for them um i think that's about it yeah definitely and you guys we're going to be doing more flounder podcast in the upcoming days so if you have any specific questions anything you want us to cover anybody you want us to bring on um please just shoot us uh, over a comment on instagram on facebook on um, the comments on YouTube or uh, on the, you can comment also on some of the podcast platforms so we keep a look or keep an eye out on all that um, and we will be happy to uh, to hopefully uh, answer what you're talking about or bring on who you're talking about so um, without me I'm just struggling for words tonight but without me uh, having to talk too much longer guys th- Michael thank you and, and thanks for tuning into this podcast you guys and we will see you in the next one later <laughs>